and give them warning from me. So I want you to notice a couple of things that God says unto Ezekiel there. Number one, he says, I am the promise that you promised me. You know, and this is the gospel. This is an unconditional promise. They preach the gospel to people. They start a church, and then that church starts preaching the gospel. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Amen. All right, here in Psalm chapter number 138, I want to begin in verse number 1, the very beginning of the chapter. The Bible says, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. I want to focus on this last part here. It says, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. This evening I'm going to be preaching a sermon on the subject of the value of God's word. The value of God's word. Now, from time to time, I like to just refresh and kind of just put everyone in remembrance of the importance of God's Word and the importance, of course, specifically for us in the King James Bible. First, before we begin, we have to define what God's Word is. The Quran is not God's Word. Amen. The, you know, the Mormon Bible is not God's word. Right. Whatever, whatever you know, holy scriptures of some other religious sect or group, whatever they consider to be holy, it's not really holy. It's not really God's word. Even amongst people that would claim Christianity, there is confusion of what is God's word. This right here is God's Word. The King James Bible. This is God's Word. Everything that is contained inside of this, there's nothing outside of this. There's nothing that I'm missing. The Apocrypha is not God's Word. The King James Bible is God's Word. Now, I want to preach to you this evening on the subject of the value or the importance or the worth of God's Word. I want you to turn with me to John chapter number 1, verse number 1. Notice here, I'm going to read to you once more, it said in Psalm 138, verse number 2 there at the end, it says, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. When you read in the Bible, when you read in the scriptures, you'll see the great importance that God holds on his name. In the New Testament, the only way to be saved is by calling upon the name of Jesus. That is the name that salvation is found in. So you see the great importance of, <coughs> excuse me, the name of God. So when we see a statement where God's word is magnified above his name, that right there, just to begin, just to start, should show the great worth or the great value that is on his words. It is the greatest thing. It is the greatest thing that we can have access to. It is the greatest thing in existence. Amen. John chapter number 1, verse number 1, further explains to us or helps us to understand why God's word, <coughs> excuse me, why God's word is of so much value. John chapter number 1, verse number 1 says this, in the beginning was the Word. That's, of course, a reference back to Genesis chapter number 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, we are independent, <coughs> fundamental Baptists. We are truly fundamentalists. And when the Bible tells me that the Word was God, I just believe that the Word was was God. That the word word here, the term word here means the same thing that it means everywhere else in the Bible. You know what it means? It means word. Open up the Bible anywhere else, do a search for the word or the term word, and it's going to have the same meaning there as it has here. Do you know what it means? This right here. The word. The word that came out of God's mouth. Now this, of course, is very easy to prove just by cross-referencing the passage that is being referenced here. In John chapter number 1, we have the same exact wording found where? Genesis chapter number 1. And what does it tell you? It tells you that God created the worlds through His Word. It goes on to say that God said, let there be light. Everything that was created was created how? By the Word of God of God. Now when we start thinking about the value of God, it's just incomprehensible. You cannot explain it. You cannot explain the worth of the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing being, which is God. And when we see a verse that tells us 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then it says this, and the Word was God. That means that the same exact value, the same exact worth that God himself has, his word has. I want you to turn to 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. <coughs> 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. Of course, this is the, 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 uh, the verse that is taught, that, that we can find taught the Trinity very clearly. We can find the Trinity taught very clearly. Look here at 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. It says this, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then it tells you again, And these three are one. So we see the same exact teaching uh, here found in 1 John 5, 7 that we saw in John chapter number 1, verse number 1. And what is it? That God is His Word. The Word is God. It really is that plain and that simple. And when someone has the faith of a child, when someone just believes what the Bible says, things like this are very simple. Right. Things, passages like this are very, very easy to understand. It just means what it says. And it says what it means. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, the same thing is being taught here. It says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I want you to go over with me to Matthew chapter number 4, verse number 4. So when you understand the value of God, when you sit there and you try to at least think of and try to even comprehend the value of God. Of course you're not going to be able to. But we can understand that God has great worth. We can understand that the almighty creator, the God and the Lord of, of all, has a great value and has a great worth. It makes perfect sense when we see statements that God will make. Of course, speaking through David where he says that he magnified his word above all his name why his word would have the same value when we see that the word is God. This makes uh, perfect sense. I want you to look in Matthew chapter number 4, verse number 4. Look at the importance that <coughs> Jesus Christ put on the word of God. The, the verse here that he quoted says in Matthew uh, chapter number 4, we'll read verse number 1. Then was Jesus led up in the, of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, <clears throat> If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. We look at verse number 4 and it says this. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, I want you to turn over to Job chapter number 23, verse number 12. Job chapter number 23, verse number 12. Notice what he teaches here. Notice what he says here when he, is, when he comes to him and he, he's being tempted, the devil that is, he comes and he tries to tempt him. And he says, hey, if thou be the Son of God, command that these, these stones be made bread. What does Jesus respond with? Jesus tells him, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So, what is the response? That we are supposed to live by the Word of God. That's how we are supposed to survive, or that's how we are supposed to live our lives. Now, how necessary is food for us? It is one, it's, it's, it's vital that you will die. And Baptists, I'm sure, are a little bit more enthusiastic about that than others, right? You have to have food. It is necessary for life. You will die if you do not have food. Well, the Bible says that you must, that the, Jesus said that the Word of God is just as vital for you in your life. That the same way that you live by bread, literally, you should be living by the Word of God. So if you look at the value of the worth that you put on food, how high is it in your life? Amen. Very high. It's, it's higher to some than others, right? It should be very high in general. It should be high because it is necessary. God created and made it necessary for us and it has a necessity to us. Well, guess what? The Word of God should have just as much of a necessity. In fact, it should have more of a necessity in our life. Look at Job chapter number 23, 
As I said, Job chapter number 23. <clears throat> Job chapter number 23, verse number 12. Job chapter number 23, this is Job speaking. Verse number 12, it says this. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. Talking about the commandment of God, God's word. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. And then he says this. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So like we just said, food of course is necessary to us. But Job here, he makes the statement that I have esteemed the words of his, of his mouth more than he says, more than my necessary food. We look at a godly man in the Bible and he says that in his life, in his life, he holds the word of God of more value and of more worth than even food itself. I want you to grasp that thought for a few minutes. How, how, you know, how many hours will you go without eating? How often? What is the average amount of hours that you'd go without eating? Maybe five, something like that? On average, you know, obviously you sleep at night, but once you wake up, what time do you normally eat? It's, you eat breakfast, 7, 8 o'clock, something along those lines, then you eat again around like 12, and then you eat again around what? 5 o'clock, and then in about another 5 to 6 hours you go to sleep. So right around 5 to 6 hours. So if we look at how much food you take in and how often you take that food in, Job says that he esteemed the words of his mouth, he said, more than my necessary food. If bread or if food, our daily food, our daily intake of nutrition is supposed to be important to us and it's supposed to be necessary for us, Job says, as a godly man, as a man who was perfect and upright, the greatest man on the earth at that time, he says that the Word of God is even more important to him than his necessary food. That's how we should be today. That's how Christians should be today. The Word of God, reading the Bible, memorizing the Bible, God's commandments should be more important to our souls, should be more important to us than even food should be. I want you to go now with me to John chapter number 6, verse number 63. We're going to look at some of the things that set the Word of God apart. <clears throat> some of the things that cause the Word of God to be of so much value. It's not normal words. The Word of God is not just normal words like my words or your words, <clears throat> the Bible says that the Word of God is living and that it is alive. Look at John chapter number 6, verse number 63. Of course, Jesus is God. The Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. So we know Jesus, of course, is God. So he spoke his words, which were the words of God. Look at John chapter number 6, verse number 63. It says this, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I want you to skip down to verse number 68. Look at Simon Peter's response. Actually, look at verse number 67 first. <clears throat> then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? So he's asking the question, are you going to leave too? There were others that left because they couldn't accept the teaching. And he looks at his disciples and he says, will you also go away or will ye also go away? Look at verse number 68. Look at Simon Peter's response. He says this, Then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Do you know what Simon Peter understood? He understood the value or the worth of Jesus Christ's words. He was saying, yeah, he answered and was responding and saying, <clears throat> Where else can I go to find the words that you have? There's nowhere else that I could go. That's the whole response. He's saying, he says, he makes the statement, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. What's his point? No one else possesses the words of eternal life. You cannot find the words that Jesus Christ spoke in anyone else. Only in God. The Word of God, the words of God are not like the words of anyone else. Muhammad's words are nothing. Right. You look at Joseph Smith, you read some of his writings, it's nothing. Right. The words of Jesus Christ are different than all words that have ever been spoken. 
Why? Because his words are living and his words are alive. They are spirit. Who else could say that about their words? That the words that I speak are living and they are alive. I want you to look also with me at Philippians chapter number 2 verse number 16. We'll see this again. The, the word of God being referred to as the word of life. <clears throat> Philippians chapter number 2 verse number 16. Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 16, it says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Turn to 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John chapter number 1. Look there at verse number 1. This is also a parallel with what we read with John chapter number 1. The Gospel of John chapter number 1. Look here again at 1 John chapter number 1, verse number 1. It says this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Verse 2, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life. Notice that. He says that eternal life. What is he referring to? The word of life. He's referring to the word of God when he says that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. What was manifested unto us? The word of life. The eternal life, right? That was manifested unto us. The word of God is not like anything else on this earth. You know why? Because it is, it is life. It is eternal life. The way that we obtain salvation is through the word of God. The way that someone receives life is from the Word of God. I want you to think about this. It is the only source of life. There is no other source of life. The Word of God is the only source of life. There is nowhere else where life can begin. It only comes from the Word of God. How did all life begin as far as creation upon this earth? The spoken Word of God. How does anyone receive eternal life? How does anyone receive salvation? It's by the Word of God. It is set aside. It is alone. There is nothing in its category. There is nothing on its level. The Word of God cannot be compared with anything else. It is of so much greater value, you can't even compare it with anything else. It's in its own category. Go to Psalm chapter number 119, verse number 154. Psalm chapter number 119, verse number 154. <clears throat> Of course, Psalm chapter number 119 is an entire psalm, a very long psalm that is just dedicated to just uh, uh, continually praising the Word of God repeatedly over and over and over again. Psalm chapter number 119, look at verse number 154, <coughs> it says this, Plead my cause and deliver me. <clears throat> and uh, I'm sorry, plead my cause and deliver me, and then it says this, quicken me, that means like giving me life, quicken me according to thy word. So the, the uh, psalmist here psalm, uh, that wrote Psalm chapter number 119, you know what he knew? He knew that if he needed life, that he was going to receive life. Do you know what the source of it was? It was from the word of God. I want you to go now with me to Psalm chapter number 19, verse number 7. Psalm chapter number 19, verse number 7. <clears throat> Just a few more passages we're going to turn to. Psalm chapter number 19, verse number 7. <clears throat> Look at Psalm chapter number 19, verse number 7. There's a couple of things that we can get from this. It says this in verse number 7. The law of the Lord. Now what is the law of the Lord? It is the word of God, isn't it? The law of the Lord is perfect. Now can that be said about anything else? Is there anything else that exists anywhere that you can say, hey, that's perfect? Like it's absolutely perfect. It's complete. Nowhere. The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. And it says this converting the soul. Can that be said about anything else? It cannot. Only the law of the Lord is perfect. Only the law of the Lord can convert the soul. It says this, the testimony of the Lord <laughs> is sure. Saying it's faithful, right? Look at what it says next. And there is nothing, I'm sorry, I jumped down, making wise the simple. So notice what it does. It says that it makes wise the simple. Turn to Proverbs. Turn to the book of Proverbs. Uh, and that's chapter number 16, verse number 16. The word of the Lord is the 
source of wisdom. It is the source of wisdom. The word of the Lord, if someone wants to be a wise man, a truly wise man, you know what he has to go to? He has to go to the Word of God. He has to go to the Word of the Lord. That's where you will obtain wisdom. That is the source of wisdom. Look at Proverbs chapter number 16, verse number 16. Look at the, the value here that is put on wisdom. It says this, How much better is it to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver. So notice the importance that is set upon wisdom. What did Psalm chapter 19 verse number 7 say? What comes from the Word of God? It says that the Word of God makes wise the simple. It is, it is wisdom. The Word of God is wisdom. Here it tells you the value or the worth of wisdom. It's greater than any amount of gold that you could obtain to. It's greater than any amount of silver that you could get. Go to Proverbs chapter number 2, verse number 6. Proverbs chapter number 2, <coughs> verse number 6. <clears throat> Here is the source of wisdom. According to Proverbs chapter number 2, verse number 6, it says this. For the Lord giveth wisdom. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. If anyone wants to become a wise man, if anyone wants to grow in knowledge and understanding, if they want wisdom, do you know where they have to go? To the Word of God. There is no other choice. There is no other option. There is no other resource where they can obtain wisdom. The Word of God is, is unlike anything else. I want you to go with me to, uh, go to uh, James chapter number 1, verse number 21. James chapter number 1, verse number 21. We'll look at this quickly, related to what we, what we uh, spoke about just a moment ago. <clears throat> Being able that the Word of God is able to save our souls. I want you to think about that. The Word of God is able to save your soul. Look at James chapter number 1, verse number 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted Word. And then it says this, which is able to save your soul. Isn't that of a great value? Something that is able to save your soul. Look at Titus chapter number 1. Titus chapter number 1, and then we have one other passage we're going to turn to. We'll end, we'll conclude in one other passage after here in Titus chapter number 1. <clears throat> there in Psalm 19.7, a moment ago, it said that the, the word of the Lord is sure. It spoke about the word of the Lord being sure. That means that the word of the Lord is faithful. That's what that means. The word of the Lord is faithful. Now, I can try to be as honest as you, to you as I can, right? You can try to be as honest to me as you can. But the Bible says that all men are liars. The Bible talks about the deceit of man repeatedly. And hey, we can tell the truth sometimes. But do you know what we're always prone to do at times? Lie. That's just a fact. That is just a fact. Man lies. Man is... We're all sinners, right? And man, hey, we can try to be a faithful steward and try to be a faithful a servant as well and as best as we possibly can. But do you know what happens sometimes? Sometimes you're unfaithful. If you were to be honest with me right now, you could think of a, a time in the past few months or so where you were unfaithful to someone, I'm sure. Where you told someone you were going to do something and whether you forgot or whatever the reason was, you didn't do it, did you? We are at times unfaithful. Do you know what's great? God's Word's not like that. Amen. God's Word's not like you. Whatever it says, it's true. Amen. Right. Whatever God says, it's, listen to me, it's sure. That's what that said a moment ago. It's sure. It's, it's, it's going to happen. It's not changing. God's Word is the same today as it was yesterday. It's always going to be the same. It is, it is never changing. God's Word is faithful. I want you to look at Titus chapter number 1, verse number 2. It says this, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. This is a verse, of course, I, I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with, but it's still a great verse. It's a great verse. You know why? Because it just reassures you, hey, God that cannot lie, that he promised this before the world began. Of course, it's even, it's even better because it's in regards to salvation. It gives you more confidence in our salvation. Isn't it great that we can go to the Word of God and that it is faithful? And we don't have to be wondering whether or not it's true, whether or not God is telling the truth. We just know that the Word of God is faithful. Do you know what that is? It's, it's th that the value of that is untold. Because you can't find it anywhere else. There is nothing, there is no one or nothing that you can go to where you can find something that is always going to be faithful to you. That is always faithful. Every time. 
Every single time, there's nothing you can return back to and know, hey, I know for a fact that this is going to be faithful. Only, only one place, the Word of God. The Word of God. This shows, this is one of the greatest things of the worth and the value, especially to mankind, the worth and the value of the Word of God, knowing that it is always sure, that it is always faithful. Now I want to end with a, a quick concept. I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 30. Deuteronomy chapter number 30. When we looked at all those things, it's meant to be a, a short and, and, and sweet sermon tonight on just the subject of reminding you the importance of the value of the Word of God, of what we have of the worth of God's Word. Sometimes you just hear it preached all the time. You read it every day. You may start to forget what we have with the Word of God. But there is truly nothing like it. There is truly nothing to be compared unto it. There is no amount of money. There is nothing that has the worth or the value that you could trade with this. That it wouldn't even would begin to stack up with the Word of God. It is the very words of the Creator. It is the Creator. That is what the Bible teaches. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of God is always sure. It is always faithful. You can't find there, that anywhere else. Amen. You go to the Quran, you go to all these other just th this trash and junk of Holy Scriptures, they are lying to you on every single page, not the Word of God. It's always true. It's always faithful. It's always sure. It's something you can always hang your hat on and you know that it's true. Not only that, it is the only source of life. It is the only place where you can receive life. It is, it is life in and of itself. It is the only place where you will be able to get eternal life. There are so many things. You know, uh, wisdom. The true source of wisdom is the Word of God. The Bible says that it is also, it's also able to save your souls. It can save your soul. Now you can look at that in two different ways. Just like that passage, it said converting the soul, right? It's talking about the law there specifically. You could look at that, number one, you could look at it in the sense of it's saving your soul like in a spiritual sense you're going to heaven, right? But uh, the word soul oftentimes is referring to the person. It can save you from death. You, you know, talking about getting wisdom, not living the life of a fool, of a drunkard, of an adulterer, of just a wicked heathen man. The, the Word of God is able to save your soul in that sense as well. It's able to save your life. It's able to lengthen the days of your life. What other book could do that? What other book? I mean, there are so many books out there, but what other book could you pick up? And it could just transform your life in such a way. Nothing. There's nothing to be compared under the Word of God. Nothing. We need to be thankful for what we have in the Word of God. You have to uh, sit there and consider for a moment just the amount of people that lived on this earth and lived on this planet that maybe lived at a time where it was illegal to have the Word of God. Maybe lived at a time where they could not possess the Word of God or they would be killed. Maybe consider the, the, the idea of, of times in history, eras, and regions wherein it was almost impossible to possess the Word of God. Where because of for <clears throat> practical reasons, for the purpose of maybe the, uh, the uh, um, um, uh, what is the, the, I can't even think of the word right now. Uh, will you print books on it? What is the name of it? It's a, Huh? The printing press, goodness sakes. The printing press. I kept thinking printer, printer, printer in my mind. The printing press was not yet invented. The printing press wasn't invented. So think about that. At a time when people, you know, they weren't, they weren't being printed in mass production. Right? So there were very few Bibles out there. There weren't near, and comparatively, relatively speaking, there were very few Bibles before the printing press. Not everyone just possessed a Bible. It wasn't practical to just to copy out by hand, you know, an entire Bible. So, a lot less people had their own Bible. There are situations maybe where you knew someone that had a Bible. Maybe the, the church, you know, years before this, the church had the Bible and you had to go there. Not even in a Catholic sense, but just they, there was only one Bible in your area. You didn't have the privilege of waking up in the morning and maybe pouring a cup of coffee and opening up the Word of God. You didn't have that. Right. There are many times you know, in history where that's the life that people live. Where people maybe you know, uh, were, were literally killed for the Word of God. Where they were, they were killed. Their lives, they put their lives on the line for this book. That they knew if I possess a Bible and I keep, the, keep this in my possession and I am found with this contraband, I will be killed. 
I will be put to death. Do you know what that tells you? That that person had a very high value or very high worth on this book. And the words that are written therein. They, they, they held them very highly. Do you know what they did? They held it even higher than their life. They said, I'm, even if I lose my life, I'd still rather have the Word of God. That the Bible, the words, were even more important than their very life. We need to be thankful and we need to be grateful for what we have. We live in modern America today of convenience and cush and comfort. There's many people that would have died to have this book by their side, by their bed, in their house. We need to be thankful that we have the Word of God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 30, verse number 10. It says this, If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep His commandments and His statutes, which are written in this book, in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. And then verse number 11, <clears throat> For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, <coughs> that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. We need to be thankful that the Word of God is very nigh unto us. That we can have and possess the Word of God and that we live at a time where you can just get on Amazon and just, hey, ship me another Bible, I lost mine. Or just go down to the local store, in the, the local Christian bookstore, and just purchase a Bible. You, you sometimes forget millions of people didn't have that opportunity. You know what you do? Days upon days go by and maybe you don't read the Word of God. And you start to lose touch with the value of this book. You start to lose touch with the worth of this book. And sometimes we need to be reminded of the, of the worth of this and what really is contained in the, these pages. Hey, this, this book right here, this binding, all of that, the paper, you could have printed anything on this, right? That's not the worth. It's that I believe deep down in the core of my soul that the words that are right here that you're looking at, these very words came off of the lips of the Creator, of the God of the universe. And that God is above all and greater than all. You can't even comprehend Him. He, he inhabits eternity. He's almighty. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He cannot be comprehended with our minds. That God is the God that spoke this book. Amen. That is the value and the worth of these words. You need to love it. You need to care for it. You know, the Bible talks about in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, it talks about how the, the word of the Lord was precious in those days because there was no open vision. That's what it says. You know what this needs to be? This needs to be precious unto you. Amen. This needs to be more important than gold and silver and any amount of money. This needs to be the most important, the most, uh, you know, a valuable item that you have. And that is the Word of God. That is the worth of the Word of God. It cannot be uh, counted, traded, compared unto. We can't even value it. We need to hold it as highly as we possibly can in regard. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. Some